Welcome, Michael Hertzfeld. Welcome to the University of Queensland. Um, Thank you. What I'd like to talk about with you is some general questions about anthropology. But to start off with, how did you get into anthropology as a discipline, and how did you become an anthropologist? Well, I was. Uh, I, I think I must have had a hankering for anthropology very early in life, because at the age of 16, I think it was, I wrote a play about... Uh, a an anthropologist somewhere in the imagined jungles of South America, um, and uh, I don't know whether that reflected some a subconscious I ideal. But uh, at that time, I actually wanted to be an archaeologist, and I did the archaeology and anthropology tripos at Cambridge. But I didn't like the archaeology very much, and although I had a hankering even then to switch either to anthropology or to modern Greek, because I already spoke Greek, and I spent a lot of my spare time hanging out with my Greek friends, uh, very much to the detriment of my undergraduate degree, I might add. Um, my advisor basically said, don't bother. Uh, so I uh, um, went off to Greece. I got a scholarship right afterwards, uh, entirely on the strength of, of my spoken Greek, because the project that I had put forward was pretty silly. But anyway, what was it? Uh, well, it was about tracking uh, Byzantine references in folklore and seeing whether they had the same geographical distribution as Byzantine pottery. And I wanted to do all this with computer modeling because that's what my advisor had been somewhat expert in. But actually, I, was, I think I was already thinking more in terms of, of anthropology. And I, I met Peter Allen, who's become a very good friend, um, who was doing his doctoral research in southern Greece. And he told me, if you want to become an anthropologist, which was the sort of noise I was beginning to make at that point, you'd better go to this conference uh, in Nicosia. That's where I met my future advisor, John Campbell, who oversaw my, my DPhil at, at Oxford. And um, uh, the, that really set the track. And now looking back, I really can't imagine myself being any good at any other profession whatsoever. So it was just as well that I did finally find my way into anthropology. What, what was it about anthropology as opposed to archaeology? That well, I think I was more interested in people, and I wanted an excuse to be around in Greece. I didn't like the way that archaeology was being taught then at Cambridge. It was very science-oriented, and that, that wasn't my, my style at all. Um, I think I had more of an interest in classical archaeology. To be fair, my advisor had warned me that you know I might not be so happy with what they did, but um, I suppose I was also rather immature, and I, wa I don't know, maybe if I'd been studying social anthropology, I would have been just as uninterested. I don't think so. I remember rather enjoying Maya Forte's lectures. He, he was lecturing to the first year students in those days, and, um, um, and Jeffrey Benjamin, um, who, with whom I subsequently reconnected, was also uh, around. But I didn't change. I was discouraged from changing, so I just goofed off more and more, hung out with my Greek friends. And I think that, plus growing up um, in a household where I was informed by my mother in a very German accent that we were not English, we were British, um, probably also sparked a lot of curiosity about people who actually knew what they were. Uh, I always had some... Uh, I don't quite know what the word is, but I, I certainly had some doubts, I think, quite early on about whether one could just have one cultural identity. Um, anyway, a, a lot of it goes back to my school days. Um, my closest friend was Thai. That's actually the proximate cause of my going to Thailand, getting interested in Thai uh, culture. Um, my Greek interests were certainly sparked by a school trip, and my Italian interest by going to Italy quite a bit with my parents, uh, who had typically, you know, German, Jewish, upper bourgeois, Berlin, um, ideas about uh, the cultural firmament in which Ita Italy, and especially Italian opera, were rather high on the list, and uh, actually I inherited that passion for Italian opera. I think it was a performance of Nabucco in 1961 when I was 14 in Italy that probably first pushed me onto that path. Um, I, it was absolutely an astounding experience, and I want to write about it sometime. But uh, um, anyway, by the time I was uh, doing my doctoral work in, uh, in anthropology, it was very clear to me that I'd finally found what I really ought to be doing, and I probably shouldn't have ever been allowed to try to do anything else. <laughs> And in, in terms of the anthropology, look, looking back, 
Mm. Um, you, you, your your work charts an interesting sort of mm. path across different, almost disciplines, or uh, across the very interdisciplinary anthropology. Well, it certainly. I mean, for one thing, it it it, it does cross from British to American <coughs> anthropology. I I think uh, I was quite surprised when I got to the states to find out how rich the American anthropological tradition was, and, and certainly the linguistic side of things appealed to me a great deal. Not the separation of a separate field called, uh, or the creation of a separate field called linguistic anthropology, but certainly the impact of all of that on social and cultural anthropology. Um, there's a Chinese anthropologist who's writing my biography, and oh, wow. uh, he's using me as an ex you know, more as, as a as I understand it, as a kind of stalking horse for thinking about the relationship between British and American anthropology. I'm not sure that I'm very typical of either, but I've certainly been strongly influenced by both. Um, so in the last decade almost, is, is that then the, the globalization of, of your <laughs> life and also anthropology? Well, I mean, it seems to be getting more and more global because I started off very determinedly saying I would never do any field work anywhere outside of Greece because there was no way I was going to reach the same level of linguistic competence uh, or knowledge of the country. I then realized I could work in Italy because I actually spoke Italian already. And um, at the age of 50, I jumped into Thai studies, um, perhaps thinking that it would be a good idea to know more about what my students go through when they have to face a completely new language, culture, religion, etc. cetera. Um, and now I'm learning Chinese because I got interested in the Chinese community in Rome, but it doesn't make much sense to focus only on the Chinese community in Rome if, you know, if you're not going to look at where they came from as well. Um, so that's a new adventure. And language is a really important aspect for you in anthropology, right? Well, languages are important for a number of reasons. I mean, obviously, first of all, it's the key to talking to your informants. Um, I don't believe that one should ever use an interpreter except when one already knows the language so well that that one realizes what the interpreter isn't saying, which is a nice way of finding out what the cultural secrets are, as it were, um, <laughs> but also uh, as a matter of respect for one's local colleagues, I think it's very important to be able to discuss with things with them in their own language, and of course if they would rather speak English, to give in to that request as well. Um, but uh, I ask my, in fact I insist that my PhD students do a lecture in the language, of the academic language of the country where they work. Um, it, apart from anything else, I think it forces one to take one's local colleagues seriously, and there's just been too long a tradition of the colonial powers producing anthropologists who simply took the attitude, well, those people there, they don't really have any theory or anything like that, and it's, it's such a contemptuous attitude and f so fundamentally unanthropological. Um, I actually think languages are fun. I mean, I'm enjoying Chinese. I'm not very good at it yet, but I intend to get better. Um, how, how many languages do you speak? Well, it now? depends how you count, because I mean, I don't you know, I don't speak the ancient languages I know, of course, and I have smatterings of things, but the, I mean, I've lectured in five, English, French, Italian, Greek, and Thai, and I have promised that within two years I will, now I'm doing it again, you see on camera, um, I'll give a public lecture in Chinese, um, and after that we'll see. Wow, fantastic. Um, for, for people who, who might not know very much about anthropology, how would you describe it in a nutshell? What is anthropology? Well, I'm not sure they'd be persuaded by this, this <laughs> by this definition, but I like to think of it as the comparative study of common sense. And what I mean by that is that in every part of the world, people assume that there are certain things you can take for granted. But if you come from somewhere else, you can't take those things for granted. And it's trying to understand why people take things that to us seem totally unreasonable entirely for granted. Why, for example, when I was working in Crete, and I asked people why they were stealing sheep. They said, well, to make friends, of course. You know, that sort of question um, is exactly the kind of question that anthropologists uh, are trying to answer. Um, I think anthropology also has a very real contribution to make. And, and here, you know, let's be serious. The other social sciences, not in their entirety, but certainly on their more scientific end, have too willingly gone along uh, with what I would call the neoliberalization of the world we live in. Anthropology, because it focuses very locally, um, unearths all sorts of exceptions that to some extent disprove the generalizations on which so much of that is based. And I would actually like, before I retire, to write something of a, of, of a manifesto of 
I don't want to say why anthropology can save the world, obviously, but I do think that anthropology, anthropologists should and could be a lot more proactive in trying to get their message across, trying to say uh, one size doesn't fit all, what makes human beings interesting and wonderful is the extraordinary variety. Language, of course, is one of many areas in which you can see that. Um, and uh, understanding the local also means understanding the global, because you then see the impact of these very large processes, the big picture processes, people like to call them, um, for ordinary people. And what we're interested in is how ordinary people live and what they mean by being ordinary people. Mm. Why do you think anthropologists haven't been more successful in, in getting out their messages, or this message precisely, mm. right? Because there's this Well, sometimes they have. I mean, Margaret Mead in the old days was very good at it. I think there's a certain aversion to self-advertisement. I also think that our very local focus sometimes makes us forget that we are actually relevant to the big picture. Um, but I feel that even when, for example, I was studying that village in the Highlands of Crete, I was actually doing uh, at the same time, something of a study of the, from the wrong end of the telescope, if you will, but of the f of the way in which the Greek nation state works. Um, in the same way, when I was working in Rome, Rome, in some ways, is one of the most marginal cities in 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 Italy. That sounds strange to say that of a capital, but the Romans themselves, or some of the Romans, the ones I know, almost seem to take pride in being marginal and speaking a dialect that everyone else looks down on, and so on and so forth. And I do think that um, trying to understand the dynamics, not of set core and periphery, that's too hackneyed, but of why people think they belong on the core or the periphery. Mm. Uh, what are the politics of, of being marginalized? Um, we're seeing today all sorts of people being marginalized who could never have imagined it would happen to them. Um, the precariousness that's being produced by the neoliberal juggernaut is sending a lot of people who hitherto had been very secure in their middle class identities right out to the outer edges of the economic system. Um, and that might be indeed a moment of opportunity for anthropology to say, wait a minute, you shouldn't be letting this happen and we have some insight into why it's happening. Hmm. That's a, that's a very important message, I guess. I think so. I don't think it should become our exclusive message, and I don't think that we should lose sight of the kind of work that we were traditionally doing in remote communities. Nowadays, it's become a bit too fashionable to say, oh, no, no, we should be working right in the center. We do work on elites. We do work on bureaucracies. We work on institutions. But at the same time, many of the lessons that we apply are lessons that we actually learned uh, from uh, working in quite exotic settings. If you think about theories like Mary Douglas's notion of dirt as matter out of place, you know, her theories of pollution, um, they go a long way to helping us understand how certain populations, for example, are regarded as marginal today. Um, but they were worked out um, historically by looking at the dietary prohibitions of various religions, including Judaism. Uh, uh, and on, on the other hand, in her own contemporary work with, uh, Af with um, African rural people. So it seems to me that uh, it's very important for us to keep in our comparative purview both the work that we're doing in big cities, like I'm doing right now in Bangkok and Rome, um, and the sort of work that um, was done traditionally in more remote communities. And I've done both. I don't know whether future generations of anthropologists will have the luxury of being able to do that, but I hope so. And in any case, they will certainly, they should be reading some of those older ethnographies, which are full of insights uh, into uh, problems that actually exist in modern, urban, globalized settings as well. Mm. well. What do you think the most pressing issue is that you're working on right now? Well, um, I've done quite a bit of work, uh, as you know, on gentrification and its impact, um, not just gentrification, but more generally the effects of heritage conservation on populations living in cities where actually the domestic architecture is an important part of the so-called heritage. So looking at the links between or among nationalism, uh, heritage, and the right to habitation, and the dynamics, and the different dynamics you get in cities where the majority are renters and the majority are owners, um, these, this gives us a very interesting window into one of the major sources of insecurity today, which is the 
increasing degree of homelessness. Um, of course, this is part of an even larger problem that uh, incorporates, um, for example, the problems of immigration, both here in Australia, but also in Europe and Southern Europe, um, where the work of people like Gregory Feldman, who is an anthropologist, is, uh, I think, extremely important. Um, so I'm fairly convinced that while we shouldn't necessarily do our research because we can save the world, I think that's a little bit of a, of a self-deception, our work can be important in helping to find our way through the, these very big problems. And anthropology, by its very nature, is necessarily political. It always speaks truth to power, whether it wants to or not, and whether power wants to listen or not. And I think power usually doesn't, frankly. But that's why I think it's now important that we find a way of voicing uh, our critiques so that people who have been dragooned into accepting situations um, that have done nothing but damage to them might be induced to think again. Uh, and I don't think that this is a political program that belongs to the right or the left. I suppose it's probably a bit more left than other, otherwise, but it's, it's critical of the domination of the world by a very small and increasingly small um, number of uh, commercial forces. I'm not necessarily against people who have a lot of money. I'm against the use of money uh, as the only value system by which the world is judged. What we're seeing increasingly today, uh, and this of course is partly the phenomenon that Marilyn Strathern has identified as audit culture, is that everything is being measured in purely economistic terms. So that the only notion of value that people seem to have anymore is money. The idea of ethical value, aesthetic value, and so on, these ideas seem to be ultimately reducible to value. If you look at people talking about art, it's always how much is that picture going to fetch in the auction room, for example. Um, why is this bad? Because it doesn't allow for alternative ways of interpreting the world. And as soon as we only speak one language and have only one conversation, any chance of independent thought is lost. And since anthropology has traditionally been concerned with the extraordinary variety of human cultural creativity, it seems to me that that's where anthropology actually has something very, very important to contribute. And the fact that a lot of people don't seem to want to listen to it is probably a sign that we're right. Mm. And what, how do you see the role of anthropologists doing that? I mean, you've talked about the manifesto, but should we be activists? Should we be storytellers? What, what, what I think do you we think should be all of that. I mean, one, one of the ways in which we do our most engaged anthropology is when we teach. Um, if I can persuade one student in a room full of 300 to be a bit less racist, I think I'm making a contribution. And I actually think we can do a great deal more than that. I think we can um, uh, get an audience of young people, many of whom are now beginning to get extremely worried about the shape of the world, to realize that there are other ways of thinking about the world and that there are fantastic resources available without being the least bit romantic, looking at uh, for example, Aboriginal communities in various parts of the globe and how they've dealt with the changing environment, uh, in some ways managing it much better than the so-called scientific West. So um, if we can trigger that interest, we're already being activists. Uh, I actually think we can do more. I found myself caught up in a very mild form of activism in both Rome and Bangkok. Um, helping people to uh, combat what seemed to be very arbitrary reasons for being evicted from their, from their homes. Um, it seems very unreasonable to insist on eviction for purely commercial or political reasons when in fact there is a serious homelessness problem, as there is in both cities. So it seems to me that what we do typically, because we are detailed people, is become activists at a very local level, but then try to understand in our writings what the implications for uh, larger, big picture type problems are, are of the sort of activism that we've been doing. So for example, in thinking about gentrification, I can talk to people who've dealt with similar problems around the world, and I can engage in a conversation about the way in which insecurity is created by um, uh, detaching people from their anchorings in a sense of home. Now, 
I myself don't have a strong sense of being anchored to any one place, but that is the privilege of somebody who has uh, had the advantage of, of, of a very good education, of a very cosmopolitan upbringing, um, and has been able, uh, through an academic career, to find a home that isn't specifically linked to any one place. I do think that we should be looking very carefully at what disruption um, does, what dislocation does to people who aren't used to those kinds of privileges. Um, and I also think we need to think very carefully about what people mean when they talk about security, because uh, talking about it simply in terms of terrorism is, again, sweeping the reasons for the terrorism under the carpet. So there are all sorts of angles, and we can have a productive and perhaps sometimes quite rambunctious conversation about exactly why various things happen. But at the end of the day, um, I would have much more faith in a set of conclusions that was grounded in a serious argument that it itself was, was based on, on uh, empirical uh, observation. And the one thing anthropologists do that almost nobody else does is to spend an awfully long time studying small groups of people and getting to know them very well and getting to know them to the point where they're no longer being, where the anthropologist that is, no longer being told uh, what people think they want to hear or what people feel they ought to hear, but rather the real concerns, complaints, as well as pleasures of the people they study.